If an asteroid like Apophis hits Earth, we will be destroyed. Massive earthquakes will strike. And tsunamis will flood everything. Apophis is a billion-year-old celestial body that has been in the solar system since its inception. So you might be thinking, well, how likely is it that this giant space stone will collide with our planet in 2029? Well, let's find out, shall we? Apophis is a big, bad asteroid discovered in 2004 by the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. Since then, it has proudly held the title of one of the most dangerous asteroids ever located. It's around 1,100 feet wide, which is a bit bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. Because of how scary it is, it was named Apophis, like the Egyptian immortal creature that was considered to bring eternal darkness and destruction to Earth. Oh boy! In 2021, researchers had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study this floating rock when it passed near our planet. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, some scientists say that there is a small chance of Apophis hitting the Earth on Friday, April 13, 2029. The Yarkovsky effect is to blame for this, since it can slightly nudge the space rock towards Earth. This effect originates from the uneven emission of thermal photons from a rotating celestial object, resulting in a fascinating force exerted upon it in space. These emitted photons possess momentum and play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics of the body. The asteroid has two sides, light and dark, just like the moon. The light side faces the sun and is warmer than the dark side. But the thing also turns, so the sides constantly change direction and temperature. This change could be detrimental because it slightly pushes Apophis toward Earth. Unfortunately, nobody knows how the Yakovsky effect will influence the asteroid's path. On the other hand, on the asteroid's last flyby of Earth in 2021, astronomers used radar to take accurate measurements of its trajectory and confidently concluded Apophis will safely miss Earth in 2029 by about 20,000 miles and won't bother us again for at least 100 years. Now, generally speaking, every 8,000 years, our planet is hit by a falling star that has similar dimensions to those of Apophis. The last time we were hit by a slightly smaller meteor was in 2013. A new spacecraft developed by NASA called the OSIRIS-REx was launched in 2016 to collect samples from another slightly less terrifying celestial body called Bennu. Four years later, it finally arrived at the thing, got some samples, quickly said goodbye to Bennu, and started traveling back towards Earth. The samples were safely stored in a capsule dropped in Utah. So far, this has been the most significant sample ever taken from an asteroid. After the delivery, the spacecraft didn't waste any time and started chasing Apophis. Now, OSIRIS-REx has been renamed to OSIRIS-APEX and is currently playing tag with Apophis. With some luck, on the 2nd of April, 2029, when the asteroid zips close by Earth, the spacecraft will reach Apophis and land on it. It will stay on Apophis for 18 months, collecting valuable information and taking thousands of pictures. The asteroid will be monitored with the help of powerful telescopes. At some point, Apophis will get too close to the Sun, and then all the monitoring work will be on Osiris's apex back. If you live in Europe, West Asia, or Africa, you're one of those lucky people who will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Apophis with the unaided eye. It'll be visible in the sky in these regions in 2029, and those who have telescopes will be able to spot it once again in 2036. Osiris Apex will experience some problems because the asteroid has a thick crust, and the spacecraft won't be able to collect data as easily as it did with Bennu. Osiris Apex has a unique thruster that will blow all the dust from Apophis while landing. This will be a perfect chance to analyze the surface of the asteroid to see what it's made of. The craft will spend one and a half years mapping the asteroid, trying to detect changes in its shape. All this research will show how the celestial body is likely to move so we can better design plans to protect Earth from such things. 
In 2025, NASA is also going to launch the mission Apophis Pathfinder, and it will be the first spaceship to ever touch this asteroid. It will land approximately a year after its launch. Also, NASA has proposed sending a swarm of tiny craft into space to help humanity develop effective protective tactics against asteroid strikes. We know that Apophis originated in the primary asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. In the past million years, this celestial body has changed its path because of the considerable influence of Jupiter's gravitation. Now it seems like it favors the Sun more, meaning this asteroid will come very close to Earth. That's why it's classified as a near-Earth celestial body. A lot of tests and research have been done to find a way to deal with asteroids. Some solutions include drilling and detonating the space body from inside, or testing new technologies, like attaching rockets to it and trying to steer it away from Earth. We can also hit it with something moving at high speeds to make it change its course. Apophis is an S-type asteroid made of rocks and minerals like iron and nickel, and is shaped like a peanut. It can tell us a lot about the past and possibly the future. Sampling this space object could reveal how life on Earth began and how plants appeared. There are many theories that suggest that water arrived on our planet on an asteroid or a comet. Asteroids are like priceless time capsules. Unlike rocks on Earth, which have undergone thousands of changes, like erosion, most celestial bodies are still intact and much easier to study. When meteors fall on Earth, they get covered in debris that's impossible to clean. That's why studying Apophis while it's still in space is so important. Also, some asteroids are made of precious metals like platinum. Right now, we have a high demand for metals that we use in production, and mining metals on Earth is quite tricky. Just one large meteor might have iron, nickel, gold, and platinum that could last us millions of years. If Apophis has this amount of metals, well, we'd want to break it down and bring it back to Earth. One space rock could be worth quadrillions of dollars, making space mining highly profitable. And still, it would cost us more to get it back to Earth than to dig up these materials here. As technology progresses and new kinds of rockets are developed, this might become possible at some point. So, even though we're safe for the next 100 years from Apophis, you probably still want to see what would happen if something like it did impact. Come on, sure you do. Well, first let me tell you, you'll hear the sound of the collision and know what's happened even if you're miles away. You should leave your house or apartment immediately. Shortly after the impact, massive earthquakes will strike and many tall buildings will fall. So staying away from cities might be your best option if you have a choice. But don't escape by car. There will be massive traffic jams and everyone will panic. Going on foot or by bike is your best option in this scenario. A prime way of transportation will be traveling by plane, so if you've always wanted to get that pilot license, now you've got a good excuse. If you have time, take along extra snacks and water, and an extra pair of socks. It's nice to live by the ocean or the sea, but in this scenario, it's the worst place to be, because giant tsunami waves will hit coastlines after the impact. If you live far away from the impact area, the tsunami might take 30 hours to arrive. You'll have a bit of time to prepare. Asteroids flying around is sometimes like a fierce game of dodgeball, where you never know when some of them can go in your direction. So we can just track the situation and hope for the best. To figure out the risks, scientists from different organizations have to study the positions and paths of the asteroids that come close to our planet especially those that are at least 0.6 miles wide. And the good news is that none of these asteroids will probably hit us for at least the next 1,000 years. Phew! To give us an idea of their power, scientists did an experiment to simulate the impact of such a gigantic asteroid. The energy released from the collision would be a mind-blowing 100,000 megatons. That's like detonating 15,000 tons of dynamite. Also, if such a big asteroid hit us, Earth would cool down significantly because of all that debris that would go into the atmosphere and block sunlight. Plants wouldn't be able to get their fuel in this case, so we'd all be in trouble, both humans and animals. Thankfully, such mammoth asteroid impacts are quite rare. 
the larger an asteroid, the longer it takes it to collide with Earth. For example, it's estimated that asteroids with diameters of at least 0.6 miles strike our planet about once every 700,000 years. And if we're talking about even bigger ones that are 3 miles wide, well those are predicted to come crashing down only once every 30 million years. Yay! But hold on, don't get too relaxed just yet. Astronomers focus on really large asteroids because those are the ones that can kind of doom our planet if they hit us. Yep, you got it right, in a dinosaur kind of way. Even if one of them didn't erase us completely, the damage would still be enormous. So, there are still some asteroids wandering around that we need to keep an eye on to see how they might evolve over time. Scientists have a model of tracking them where they focus on the parts of an asteroid's path that come close to our planet to see if the space rock poses a risk to us. And it seems there might be one asteroid, 7482, 1994 PC1, 3,600 feet in diameter that might pose some danger. It's supposed to come closer to our planet in the next 1,000 years. And when I say risky, it means there's a 0.0151% chance of it coming within one Earth-Moon distance. It already passed by us in 2022, but we were lucky because it was far enough 1.2 million miles. I'd say we can relax when it comes to asteroid scenarios. For now, asteroids slamming into Earth would be new for humankind, but not for the planet itself. As I said, there weren't many of those big ones, but they still had enormous consequences. The first one that comes to most people's minds is, of course, the dinosaur asteroid as big as a mountain that struck our home planet around 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It was chaotic. Global firestorms and tsunamis were all over the place. Dust was blocking out the sun, and vaporized rock released sulfur, which then led to acid rain and the acidification of the oceans. But there was an even bigger fella that came before that one. Around two billion years ago, a gigantic asteroid crashed into our planet and left a massive crater in South Africa. The one we know today as the Redifort Crater. And it seems this asteroid might have been even bigger than we all originally thought twice as wide as the space rock that erased dinosaurs. The Redifor Crater is confirmed to be the biggest visible crater on Earth, with a diameter of about 99 miles. It used to be even bigger when it first formed, though. Maybe even 155 to 174 miles across. It's hard to figure out its true size because the crater has been eroding for the past 2 billion years. Think of it like slicing off layers from the rim of a bowl. The diameter gets smaller with each slice. When the asteroid, 7 or 5 miles wide, that wiped away dinosaurs hit Earth about 66 million years ago, it caused massive destruction. Forest fires, acid rain, tsunamis, and so much ash and dust that it changed Earth's climate. This all made about 75% of life on our planet extinct. The asteroid that created the Redifort Crater was not only bigger, but it also traveled at a higher speed. Which means the consequences there would have been even worse. But it happened a long time ago, and living beings were different back then. Maybe it was some bacteria that didn't even notice that something unusual was happening. Earth is not the only one. Lots of impacts have happened across our solar system too. For example, in our close neighborhood. Yup, moving to Mercury and its massive crater called the Caloris Basin. It measures about 950 miles across, which is more than the state of Texas. There's a ring of towering mountains around the crater which makes it look even more impressive. You can see different colors in the mosaic image of the Caloris Basin. They tell us more about the geology of the basin. The orange parts represent lava that once flooded the basin. These lava flows covered the original surface and added this specific orange hue. And after the lava flooded the basin on Mercury, smaller craters formed on top of the lava surface. These craters dug into the ground and uncovered the material hidden beneath the lava. Some of this material is blue in color. And this blue stuff could be a clue about what the original floor of the basin had looked like before the lava covered it. Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, has a thick atmosphere that comes with a pretty good defense system against space rocks. It's so dense that it burns up most meteors before they even reach its surface. As a result, you won't see as many visible craters on Venus as on other rocky planets in our solar system. But Venus still has some scars that can tell us about some serious impacts that happened there. And one of the biggest scars we know about is Mead Crater. It's enormous, about 170 miles in diameter. The inner floor of this crater is relatively flat and kind of brighter than its surroundings. 
It's possible that the crater ended up filled with a mixture of melted rock after the impact, and maybe even lava from volcanic activity on Venus. Want to get an idea of what Earth might look like without its protective layer called atmosphere? Just take a look at the moon. Its surface is littered with impact craters. This Tycho is one of the craters you'll easily notice on the moon. When you look at the full moon, you can spot it as a distinct circle with bright rays that radiate outward, slightly off-center on the lower left side of the moon. This crater, 53 miles wide, has a beautiful central peak in the middle that's topped with an intriguing boulder. The size of this boulder is impressive. It would fill about half of a typical city block here on Earth. When talking about craters, we definitely can't leave out Mars. The red planet has a much thinner atmosphere than Earth. When spacecraft approach Mars, they rely on the planet's atmosphere to slow them down as they enter it. And indeed, the atmosphere helps slow spacecraft down during landing. But it's still not thick enough to completely protect Mars from all those space rocks that are coming all the time. From July to September 2018, a dark spot appeared on the southern pole of Mars. It consists of two distinct patterns. A theory says that the bigger, lighter colored blast pattern can be the result of an impact shock wave scouring the ice surface. The impact generated winds that spread out and scoured the ice. The inner blast pattern, which is darker in color, occurred because the impacting object managed to penetrate the thin ice layer. As it hit the surface, it sent dark sand and debris flying in all directions. We're flying past the planets of our solar system. We pass by Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then we move through dark space beyond the edge of our world. We've reached our destination. It's the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical region around the solar system that holds tons of asteroids and blocks of ice. It's likely to be where the largest comet in human history was born. And now, it's heading toward the sun. Bernard and Nellie Bernstein was discovered totally by accident during the Dark Energy Survey. Our telescopes were pointed at distant space. Their main goal was to learn more about how the universe was expanding. Astronomers also wanted to make a more detailed map of the observable universe. Scientists analyzed over 80,000 images and found a moving object. It was alarmingly close to our home planet. Its size was an impressive 62 miles. That's about the width of Lake Michigan. It was an already active comet with a long tail. Usually, comets get a tail when they come close to the sun. The heat from the star warms the comet's surface, and light materials, like ice, begin to evaporate. This forms a cloud of steam and dust that stretches far beyond the comet. But Bernardinelli Bernstein is too far away from the sun to start heating up. This means that its surface has a different composition. It might be solid carbon monoxide. This increases the luminosity of the comet. That's why it can be observed with telescopes on Earth. We can compare Bernardinelli Bernstein to the largest meteorite to ever fall on Earth. About 66 million years ago, our planet was hit by a meteorite about six miles wide. At that time, the blast wave from the collision went around Earth several times. Tsunami waves caused by the impact were taller than the largest skyscrapers, and the energy from the explosion set huge areas on fire. Almost all living creatures, including dinosaurs and ancient fish, ceased to exist. The meteorite left a crater three times the size of Manhattan. The place where it fell was rich in sulfur. This substance evaporated because of the abnormal heat and gathered into massive clouds. This caused acid rains that were falling on Earth for several more weeks. Our newly discovered comet is 10 times bigger. If it were flying toward Earth, you'd see it with the unaided eye long before the impact. It looked like a moving star in the night sky. A few days before the comet reached our planet, you'd see it even during the day. You'd be able to distinguish its long tail, too. When the comet entered the atmosphere, it'd produce a booming sound so loud you'd hear it on the other side of Earth. At this point, the comet would begin to heat up because of friction with the air. It'd start burning. Countless pieces of debris would break away from the main body of the meteorite and fall to Earth. As soon as Bernardinelli Bernstein touched the surface of the planet, we'd see a flash so bright it outshine the sun. In a fraction of a second, a colossal amount of energy would be converted into heat. This would create the most powerful explosion in the history of our planet. It'd literally rip out chunks of ground and throw them into the air. 
the blast wave would incinerate everything within a few hundred miles. It continued to spread in different directions, breaking and bending trees. At one point, it reached snow-capped mountains and triggered huge avalanches that would cover many villages. The blast wave would go around the planet, shattering glass and buildings on all continents. Tsunami waves would be so high they would cover entire coastal cities. The most powerful earthquake in history would break the ground and create deep cracks. After the impact, billions of tons of dust and ash would rise into the air. A giant black cloud would completely block the sun's rays. Earth would be plunged into darkness. All the debris in the air would start melting. They'd turn into liquid lava and fall back to the surface, causing even more damage. The ash and dust in the air would cover the sun for several more months. During this time, the temperature on Earth would drop by several degrees. Even if they were hiding in deep shelters and bunkers, people, as well as all other living organisms on the planet, would be unlikely to survive this event. Fortunately, Bernard and Ellie Bernstein isn't going to approach Earth. Right now, the comet is about 20 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 20 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. It means the comet will soon cross the orbit of Uranus. In 2031, it'll be 11 astronomical units away from our star. That's just outside Saturn's orbit. This is going to be the closest Bernard and Ellie Bernstein will approach the Sun. Then it will begin its flight back to the edge of the solar system. But the comet is bound to return again. It'll move away from the Sun and slow down until the star's gravity pulls it back. Then the comet will make another circle around our solar system. But that will take about 3 million years. Right now, we have other meteorites to worry about. For example, 3200 Phaedon. It crosses the orbits of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Then it goes around the Sun and comes back. This cycle takes about 523 days. Then it starts over again. This meteorite is considered potentially hazardous because it crosses Earth's orbit at 7.5 Earth-Moon distances. During one of its last approaches to Earth, this 3.6-mile wide block of rock showered our planet with small meteors. Since the asteroid often passes by the Sun, its surface is most likely to look like the dry bottom of a mud swamp. It's covered in scales and cracks. As it flies past Earth, these scales break off and cause meteor showers. But the largest, potentially hazardous asteroid is the 1999 JM8. It's about the size of 77 soccer fields. It passes by Earth at nine lunar distances. Its closest approach to our planet will happen in August 2137. If such a meteorite were to hit Earth, an entire continent could be wiped out. The rest of the world would experience massive tsunamis, but would survive the event. So naturally, scientists are thinking of ways to protect the planet from such a disaster. The first solution is a controlled Big Bang. One of the laws of physics says that if you apply some force in one direction, it'll cause a reaction in the opposite direction. So if we spot an asteroid that is about to collide with Earth, we'll need to send a rocket toward it. This way, we'll produce a controlled explosion not inside, but right above its surface. The blast will be directed upward, and the asteroid will shift downward. Even this tiny shift would be enough to change the trajectory of the asteroid, and then it'll fly past Earth. Another way is to send a heavy object, like a spaceship, toward the space body. Every heavy object has its own gravity, so the spacecraft will have to fly close to the asteroid, which will attract the ship to its surface, but the engines of the spacecraft will resist. The ship will start pulling the asteroid in the opposite direction. This will change the trajectory of the asteroid, and our planet will remain intact. We can also ram the asteroid with the spaceship. Bang! Or, we could build a space station, like the ISS. It would be equipped with a bunch of huge magnifying lenses. We would send the station closer to the sun and start looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Then, we'd point all the lenses so that the sun's rays would focus on the giant rock. The heat would begin to vaporize the matter from the asteroid's surface. That's where physics would come into play again. The matter would evaporate upward, and the asteroid would move downward. We could also wrap the asteroid in a reflective film, something like foil. Usually, space bodies absorb most of the sun's rays, but if the asteroid was covered in foil, the rays would bounce off its surface. 
This would create a weak pushing force. That should be enough to avoid the collision. Of course, we could attach rocket engines to the asteroid. This way, we would be able to not only change its trajectory, but also control it. But that would depend on the size of the asteroid and the number of engines. And then, we could use this massive rock to ram it into other, larger asteroids. Imagine flying in a spacecraft in a cloud of asteroids at high speed. You dodge one, one more, and then hit the gas pedal to the floor and crash into an asteroid at full speed on purpose. This is exactly what NASA is going to do in the near future. The entire mission will begin at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on November 24th. Let's follow it step by step. So the Falcon 9 booster rocket is already on the launch pad. It's as tall as a 22-story building, or 11 giraffes. And it can get about 8 tons of cargo into orbit. So you could send a big elephant into space and a supply of food for it. Countdown. 3, 2, 1, ignition! Smoke clouds everywhere, and the rocket begins to gain altitude. Nine engines are working at full power to accelerate the rocket. At its peak, it reaches speeds 10 times faster than the speed of sound. And then the rocket engines shut down, and the rocket's first stage undocks to return to Earth. A couple of seconds later, the second stage receives the ignition command. It turns on its one engine and climbs even higher to orbit. The cargo capsule then opens and releases the DART spacecraft. DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Once released, the spaceship deploys two large solar panels. It'll convert solar energy into electrical energy to power a revolutionary ion engine. Conventional engines create thrust by burning tons of fuel and ejecting it outward. The rocket itself is essentially pushing off the emitted gases. The ion engine will not burn fuel. It'll use a strong electric field to accelerate the ionized gas. Like conventional rockets, it'll eject this gas and create thrust by repelling it. And though the ion engine produces less thrust, it can accelerate the spacecraft to higher speeds. So regular rocket engines have an excellent performance on the road. They push the pedal to the metal, burning a bunch of fuel, while the ion engine slowly accelerates. But when a conventional rocket needs to make a refueling stop, the ion spacecraft will whiz past the regular one at insane speeds. So the DART spacecraft begins its year-long journey. By comparison, a flight to Mars would take about seven months. Fast forward one year ahead, and we've arrived. This is the asteroid Didymos. The far point of its orbit is two astronomical units from our star. That's two Earth-Sun distances. At this point, the Sun begins to pull the asteroid back, and then it approaches the closest point to the star, one Earth-Sun distance. That is, its orbit lies very close to the orbit of our planet. Didymos made its closest approach to Earth at a distance of about 4.8 million miles. That's 20 times farther than the Moon's orbit. It takes 770 days to complete one such revolution around the Sun. So Didymos is not considered a hazardous asteroid, but in the future, it'll approach the Earth even closer. And the consequences of a collision with it could be catastrophic, given its size. It's bigger than two Empire State Buildings, and it rotates at a rate of one revolution in two hours and 15 minutes. So it has a tremendous amount of energy. Plus, it has an asteroid companion. It's a small pebble 520 feet wide. It's like 12 school buses or 10 train cars. Its orbital period, that is, the time it takes the pebble to make a complete circle around the asteroid, is about 11.9 hours. NASA believes that asteroids up to 80 feet wide are likely to burn up completely in our atmosphere due to friction with the air, so they're not hazardous. Asteroids between 80 feet and half a mile in size will not burn completely and could cause severe damage. And asteroids over half a mile have the potential to wipe out large cities or even entire states. In that sense, we can consider Didymos potentially hazardous. So we're going to test one way of defending against asteroids on it, kinetic impact. That's why we sent DART here. So our spacecraft is going to hit an asteroid, only not its main body, but its little companion. DART is already moving toward it at about four miles per second. At that speed, a trip from New York to Washington, DC would take less than a minute. And a trip across the United States from coast to coast would take about 10 minutes. DART is getting close. Three seconds to impact. Two, one, bam! 
The spacecraft crashes into the asteroid at full speed. What are your predictions? Asteroid explodes and is blown to pieces? Or asteroid flies off the main body into space like a billiard ball? Well, scientists predict that this collision will reduce the speed of this small asteroid by a fraction of a percent. But it'll still be enough to reduce its orbital period by a few minutes. Then our telescopes on Earth will be able to study the effects of the collision in more detail. And to learn even more, we'll send another spacecraft to Didymos on another mission. This is Hera. It'll be launched in 2024 and is scheduled to arrive at Didymos around 2027. This spacecraft will carry a bunch of research equipment to assess the collision damage done by DART. When it arrives, Hera will take many pictures of the small asteroid, including a fresh impact crater. Hera will also be carrying two CubeSats. These are miniature space probes, smaller than a shoebox. It'll launch these mini satellites, and they will make an even closer approach to the asteroid. They will study this space rock for three to six months. At the end of the mission, one of them will attempt to land on the asteroid's surface to learn even more about its composition and internal structure. It's also possible Hera will carry a mini impactor. This thing will have to make another impact on the asteroid. Then scientists will be able to evaluate the difference in impacts with a large spacecraft and a small one, and understand how we can defend against asteroids in the future. In theory, we don't need to send a giant rocket to a dangerous asteroid to destroy it. A single strike might be enough to shift the trajectory of the asteroid slightly. On a cosmic scale, changing the trajectory, even by a fraction, would dramatically change the asteroid's finish point. But kinetic impact is not the only way to deal with hazardous asteroids. Check out the gravity tractor. For this technique, we need to send a spacecraft toward the asteroid too. Only, it won't crash into it. It'll have to go into its orbit. Any asteroid has a force of attraction, and it'll pull the spacecraft toward it. But the spacecraft's engines will keep it at the same altitude. So the asteroid itself will start attracting to the spacecraft. This method is reliable enough, but it takes a long time. And it'll only work if we detect a potentially hazardous asteroid many years before it arrives at Earth. We should have enough time to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and then carry out an asteroid tractor technique. The other option is a laser. When an asteroid is found, we need to aim a powerful laser beam at it. It'll heat up a certain point on the asteroid, causing the material there to evaporate. This is where physics comes into play. The material on the asteroid evaporates upwards. It makes the asteroid itself move downward. Just like our rocket engines work, the burning fuel is ejected one way and the spacecraft moves the other. We can also use solar power instead of lasers. To do that, we need to build a big space station, which would be equipped with a lot of magnifying glasses. Have you ever tried to burn letters on a wooden surface with a magnifying glass? Well, we'd be doing the same thing, but with an asteroid. The space station will have to focus lots of the sun's rays into one point on the asteroid. Again, the material evaporates because of the high temperature, and this causes the asteroid to change its trajectory slightly so that it flies past our planet. How about foil? That's right, we can avoid a collision with an asteroid by using ordinary foil. We would have to wrap the asteroid in the same reflective material. Then the asteroid won't absorb the sun's rays, but will instead reflect them. This creates a little pressure on the surface of the asteroid. It's as if the sun's rays are pushing the asteroid, and it'll be able to change its trajectory. And not the most obvious but reliable option is conventional rocket engines. We can put several powerful engines on the asteroid. This would create thrust and change the trajectory of the asteroid. And if there are enough engines, we can even take control of the asteroid. So when a bigger space rock appears on the horizon, we'll turn on our engines and point the asteroid straight at it. Such a collision can completely destroy even a very large asteroid. And it would make for one epic light show. Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation, like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out. The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our Sun. And when it was just a baby planet, 
it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. Gas in the disks helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, Rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets, as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects, like comets and asteroids in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star, while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot, while the other is extremely cold. Hmm. If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong, and over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. Tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters, they're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. 
As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around that. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them, there might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. This system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows, those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun or a bit smaller. 
The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot, but their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf, and thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, Back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor. But those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age five to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, 
James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here is one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. Ah, space, the final frontier. It's a vast and mysterious expanse that has fascinated us for centuries. But as much as we've learned about it, there are still plenty of things that we've been lied to about when it comes to space. Let's take a look at some of the biggest lies we've been told about this topic. First off, we have the idea that space is just this pristine, untouched wilderness. But that's not exactly true. We've been littering space with our debris for decades. Everything from old satellites to rocket parts. In fact, there are over 20,000 pieces of debris orbiting Earth right now, and they're causing all sorts of problems for future space missions. So if you're planning on visiting space anytime soon, watch where you go. You never know what kind of garbage might be floating around. Did you know that the sun is not actually yellow? It's green. Well, kind of. You see, scientists measure the temperature of a star by the color spectrum it emits. Cooler stars appear red, while the hottest of stars look blue. Our sun emits most of its energy at a wavelength that's close to green. But because it emits other wavelengths too, all these colors mix together and your eyes see this vibrant mixture as white. From Earth, however, the sun looks yellow because our atmosphere is really good at scattering blue light. If our star was actually yellow, Earth would become a frozen rock and we'd all be polar bears. Plus, the sun isn't on fire for real. It's a big ball of gas, mostly made of hydrogen and helium and it works more like a gigantic nuclear reactor, constantly fusing hydrogen atoms to create helium inside its core. This process releases enormous amounts of energy. That's why the sun is so hot. Oh, and speaking of setting things on fire, explosions in space aren't real. Sorry, Star Wars fans. A spaceship can't go down in a violent blast because there is no air out there in space. No air means no oxygen. And no oxygen means no fire. Now, you might also think that there are too many stars in the night sky for you to count. But in fact, you can do that. According to the Yale Bright Star Catalog, there are 9,110 stars that you can see from Earth with the unaided eye. 
So, technically, you can count them, but I wouldn't be surprised if you lost count. And if you're worried about flying through an asteroid belt, don't be. Although it does have trillions of space rocks that range in size from space dust to a quarter of the size of the Moon, they're very spread out. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is 140 million miles across, which is one and a half times the distance between Earth and the Sun. This spreads space rocks thousands of miles apart, making it almost impossible for a spacecraft to collide with one. You'll instantly freeze in space without a suit. Nope, you won't turn into a popsicle right away. It's going to take a bit longer than that because heat and cold don't really move very quickly in the vacuum of space. But unfortunately for you, there's a bigger problem at hand. You won't be able to breathe. After just 15 seconds, your brain won't be getting enough oxygen from your blood and you'll pass out. And then after just two minutes, it's curtains for the rest of your organs. So, in short, if you find yourself playing astronaut without a spacesuit, it's game over pretty quickly. Did you know that space doesn't have any temperature at all? That's because the temperature is defined by the speed at which particles move and the amount of energy they have. In the true vacuum of space, there are no particles to move around, making it temperatureless. Of course, some parts of space are really hot, like areas around stars. But the further away you get from stars, the more spread out particles are, making those areas of space pretty chilly. Number 9 is our planet's shape. No, it's not flat, but it's not a perfect sphere either. Yeah, it bulges at the equator because of our planet's wild spin. It's like Earth is doing its own little dance. And because of this bulging, launching spaceships from the equator is much easier than from the poles. Now, when it comes to sound in space, it's a bit of a tricky situation. You might think that no one can hear you scream, but that's not entirely accurate. The thing is, sound needs something to travel through, like air or water. In space, things are super spread out, so all those epic space battles and galactic explosions would be completely silent. Yet there are some places in space with enough particles for sound to travel through. For example, you can hear the black hole at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster. Another myth is about zero gravity. That's not a thing. There's still some gravity hanging around the International Space Station, about 90% of what we feel on good old Earth. But astronauts get to float around because they're basically free-falling around the planet. And let's be real, Hollywood's version of space travel is not factual. Sure, orbits are a thing, but different altitudes mean different speeds. So moving from one orbit to another isn't exactly a walk in the park. You can't just push yourself in the right direction and hope for the best. You gotta take those orbital velocities into account. This reminded me of the 2013 movie Gravity and how Sandra Bullock tried to survive in space. Hollywood sure added some fuel to these myths. Yet again, who can blame them? Back in 1976, NASA's Viking 1 spacecraft snapped a photo of a curious rock formation on Mars that looked suspiciously like a face. Some folks out there claimed that it must have been proof of extraterrestrial life on the Red Planet, but NASA had a different take. According to the space agency, the face was nothing more than a bunch of rocks piled up in such a way that the shadows they cast created an illusion of facial features. It turns out it was just a regular hill that got a little too much credit for being photogenic. The solar system stays in place. Lie! It's zooming through space at a speed of 140 miles per second, which means that it's whizzing through the cosmos faster than a cheetah chasing its prey. It takes us 230 million years for the solar system to complete a full orbit around the Milky Way. It's a good thing it isn't getting a speeding ticket, because that would be one astronomical fine, eh? Without the sun, planets would be pretty chilly. We're talking about temperatures as low as negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Brrr. But with the sun around, the planets get to enjoy much more livable temperatures. 
Of course, not all planets are created equal. Mercury, for example, is the closest to the Sun. Venus, on the other hand, is farther away, but somehow manages to be even hotter than Mercury. The distance from the Sun isn't the only factor that affects a planet's temperature. Other things like the planet's size and reflectivity also come into play. So Mercury being the hottest planet in our solar system is a false proposition. No, just because it's the closest one to the Sun doesn't mean it's the hottest. Even though we've been deceived in some ways, that doesn't make space any less amazing. It's still a vast, beautiful, and utterly fascinating part of our universe. And there's still so much we have yet to discover. Who knows, maybe one day we'll really discover little green people out there. Or maybe we'll find out something even more incredible. Until then, we'll just have to keep dreaming and exploring. There, you got 14 things on our list. Do you have any other space myths to debunk?